One thing I always say when you're doing panel discussions is you're supposed to have somebody who keeps track of it. So basically, my job is to be sort of the, the uh, uh, administrative assistant uh, for this, for this uh, exercise, um, because all the really important people are coming up behind me. And, uh, and you know, the, the title of this panel is, is uh, you know, why I hate making games, exactly, or what I hate about making games. And I first really didn't like that title. I didn't come up with that title. Uh, because I hope that everyone is here because they either love games or they love making games. I mean, I hope no one is here just because this is the way they, this is, this is something they've been forced into doing. I think the game industry tends to really not be that way. Um, and, uh, you know, I, I, you know, it, you know, who here actually loves playing games, first of all? Yeah, right. And who here actually loves building games? All right. So more players than builders, which is fine. Um, but, uh, so, so, so the title of this presentation is What Do You Hate About Making Games? But I, want, I wanted to start out initially saying, Hopefully, we all really love games, and most of us really love making games, because otherwise we wouldn't be here. And um, so let, let's introduce our panel. Um, well, so uh, we've got Saad Chaudhry, who's the uh, VP of Miniclip. Just, just come on stage. Yeah, just come on stage as I introduce you. We've got Chris Sappho, who's the uh, CTO of Sega Europe. Um, where's Andy? Oh. Uh, well, anyways, we've got, we've, got, we've got Doran Kagan. Oh, there we are. And Andy Sorry. Payne from Massatronic. Apologies. And also, founder of Rappy Nation. I wanted to make sure I included that. Yeah, thank so, you. So please welcome. Um, so I'm not going to start off with asking what do you hate about making games, but I, I want to talk about a couple of different areas. So one is we've been seeing a huge switch from in gaming from kind of traditional style PC gaming to, uh, you know, to a lot of web gaming, and now mobile gaming is, is what's really, really hot. So I wanted to talk about, first of all, as an initial question, what are things that are challenging when it comes to making that switch? You know, what, what are things that you, that, you, that you used to be able to do that you can't do anymore? What are things that you're struggling with in terms of making the switch between traditional gaming and into mobile gaming, or from web gaming to mobile gaming? So I was just going to throw this out here to the panel. So I, I, I guess I'll start then. Make yeah. It yeah, please, please. Yeah, that's right. Um, so yeah, Miniclip has gone through this transition um, quite visibly. Uh, we're, we're very well known as um, a web portal, web platform. Mm -hmm. um, and over the last three and a half years, we've um, set up our mobile division, uh, both developing and publishing. Um, Essentially, I think the biggest challenge is the platform, the mobile platform has so many issues that you have to solve before you can even really publish a game on there. So it's, you know, not only that you have to optimize it if you're making a multiplayer game, which we do, um, for the kind of uh, mobile kind of amount of data you can send across the network mm -hmm. to um, user acquisition, which is the big elephant in the room for most people. Um, and then touch device, so just the input and the UI and the UX that you have to solve. Um, so those, those are um, some interesting challenges that you have to meet before you can even really think about, you know, just essentially taking a web game to the mobile platform. Uh, so we've been doing it for about three and a half years now. Uh, we think we've got it down to um, a bit of a science, a little bit of an art, mm -hmm. uh, especially with one of our games, our flagship title, which is 8-Ball Pool. Um, and we're still, we're still figuring it out. It's not easy. I think on the web, it was um, you have mouse and keyboard input, which makes, uh, you know, we've had that for the last 20 plus years. Mm -hmm. um, and touch devices have come since basically the iPhone. We won't talk about Windows CE. So, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, pro I program for that platform. I can, yeah, I, 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 yeah we, should, we shouldn't talk about it. No, we won't. We won't. Um, <laughs> Yeah, so f for us, we've kind of we've not come from the web. Obviously, I've come from console and PC right. as a background, and actually, we kind of figured that we probably didn't know that much uh, two years ago when we started doing mobile, and it took about six months to actually start to learn what we didn't know. You know, you have to you've got this thing where you've got unknown unknowns and known unknowns, and we didn't even know the known unknowns for for some months, so that was <laughs> interesting. You know, we're a bunch of guys who've been doing console games for maybe ten or fifteen years. We kind of thought, right, we need some analytics in there, so we'll, we'll make a game and hopefully we'll have some things that people want to buy and we'll put some analytics in and then we'll figure out how they're doing and then we'll change some things. And actually, that doesn't go very well at all. Um, 
obviously, as part of Sega, we've got quite big IPs, so there's a big advantage there. You were talking earlier about UA. Um, obviously, if you've got some, someone like Sonic the Hedgehog, he kind of sells games without um, too much fuss. You don't need to do too much advertising. But then He is your UA. He is our UA. Yeah. But actually, after that, that's, the, that's where the, the work begins. And it's very different because when you put a game on a disc, you sell it, your work is finished. And actually, that's where the work is just starting. And we kind of didn't understand that. Um, you know, we sort of, in our heads, we sort of knew it, but now we're starting to understand that instinctively. So um, the pattern of game development is very different. When you first release that game, that's your first first point. Um, but then you're really looking at retaining users and making sure users are engaged and talking about all of these things that some of these guys have been presenting on today, which is looking at data, making sure that you've got the social aspects nailed in there, <clears throat> making sure that you know you've got different types of players in the games. Um, and catering for all of those players, you know, it's, it's just a, a much bigger expanse that you're looking at as a game developer. Um, one of the, you know, what do I hate about making games? That's a question I've been thinking about. What can, what can I answer? You know, to Dan's point, mm -hmm. we're all here because we like making games and we like the business, I think. Um, but the one thing I wasn't so fond of with console development was crunch. And we would end up, you know, the best will in the world, the best planned projects, you would end up doing some heavy hours towards the end of game releases. We actually can't do that now because with games as a service, if you crunch, you're knackered and you still need to maintain the game and that doesn't go very well. So it's actually quite a nice pace for game development now, doing mobile games and just releasing a game and maintaining it. So that's been good. Well, I think, and I think you touched on something there, you know, that, that, uh, that, that, the, that the people who were developing web games were a lot closer to what we're doing in the sense of uh, they already were developing games as a service to a large degree. Yep. And they already were thinking of very, very quick execution cycles and a lot of data analysis. Because that's, that's just, that's just the, what's ingrained in being in the web. So I think, I think that you know, the, it is interesting, I think, coming from the console. Now, the thing that's interesting is also I think that people on, on, on these mobile devices are engaging uh, you know, long for long periods of time, but in very, very short sessions. Um, and I think that's I think that's also a change. So in terms of content, you know what you know, and, and I want I want to continue throwing this out to the panel because um, I was that was also so I was leading kind of two things with the question. One is that in terms of not only in terms of uh, the way one makes games, but in terms of the content within the games, mm -hmm. you know, how how do you see that changing <laughs> as well? So just keeping going. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> from my point of view, I'll let you answer in a minute. Yeah, because okay. yeah. <laughs> that's an interesting thing as well. Because we were making games that would, you know, we'd be like, is it an eight-hour game or a ten-hour game? Right, ten-hour game, we're done. That's a good console game. Now we're making games that la need to last hundreds of hours, but in, in very short, short bursts. So that's yeah, that's a big difference as well. But sorry, yeah, I'm sorry, sure. Let's thing. keep going. <laughs> Thank you. Hey, I'm Doron. I'm from the media. Uh, we are a boutique publisher. Um, we don't publish a lot. We publish only on mobile. Uh, we have hundred million downloads. Uh, mainly from Trial Extreme. Um, we were born in the Java days, so I don't have a lot of uh, uh, console experience. But in today's world, to think about a game that you can design in a studio uh, with the best brains <laughs> in the country and to release it in six months, 12 months to the market without any ability to change it is unthinkable today. When we finish a game that we think is close to perfect from our perspective, we first uh, soft launch it in a couple of Canada, Australia, New Zealand. And then we, uh, using Google Analytics and other tools, learning that everything that we thought that the user will do, <laughs> he's not doing, and he's doing the other way around. So learning the behavior of the user in a soft launch by uh, measuring the, uh, by learning the behavior of a few thousand, ten thousands of users allows us to change the pattern to a pattern that the users, the potential clients, are voting in their legs. What they really want to see in the game, where do they go? They don't go to where we want them to go, they go to the uh, other way around. So yes, I totally agree, the, the web uh, developers are much closer to today's market because the model of ongoing uh, uh, work on the game rather than the release is more or less the end of the, of the game. For us, it's uh, only the beginning. And the major uh, change that it brought is that if this market used to be ruled by companies like Sega that had the ability to be a worldwide distributor because they had the relationship and they, have the, and they had the money, here in the room, you can, there might be a developer that is sitting with a Unity uh, license or without the Unity license, <laughs> and he can publish a game and be all over the world tomorrow morning and by chance to be the next big uh, thing. 
So for me, this is the, the big thing. Yeah, it's been disruptive for the old fossils, I think, yeah. slightly. So, so one thing is, so is, is you touched on something that I thought was kind of interesting. So I want to I kind of pull the room here. So how many people, first of all, do soft launches of their titles? Just kind of by do soft launches. And, and, and how many people have actually used um, an alpha or beta launch within Google Play? OK, not as, ma not as many. Just, I'm just kind of curious. It's one of the things that I was really excited about last year was that we added the ability to, to actually create a community, either a G Plus community or a Google group, and do a soft launch to that, to that group. And it's kind of useful for, for testing internally. So I was just sort of curious. Um, but I think that's actually a huge change. Um, it's actually funny. I think it was in 2007 at GDC that, that Microsoft announced that they were actually using analytics to generate heat maps for where people died in various levels of Halo 3. And, and that was like, whoa, you know, and it's like, and now, and now I think that if, if you release a title without having analytics and without knowing, you know, where people were dying and getting struck, stuck and frustrated, you know, you'd be look like you, would, you wouldn't know what you're doing in some ways. And so I think it's, I think we've changed our, 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 our relationship to big data has changed. No, I, I think you are totally right. And I just want to add at this mm -hmm. point, the, the ability to change the game while it's running and to meet the next user that will download it with a better product than the mm -hmm. previous uh, user that downloaded it, this is a critical thing. And what Google done, and I think the, the fail is the, the fail to communicate it. The A-B testing that Google released that I found out just by mistake, I think eight months ago or something, is a, an amazing tool. It allows us, and we do it for every release that we do. If we do an update to an existing game or an existing app, we first release it to 50% in specific uh, audience. And then we see how they react, and we decide if to release the additional 50% or to wait with the 50% to send another update because it didn't work as good as we thought, or maybe a technical problem with some devices, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one of the things that I, that I was really excited about last week, which we aren't going to cover here today, um, but we actually announced it and launched it at, um, at GDC la uh, last week, was we actually did launch uh, Google Tag Manager for mobile. So if you want to go beyond um, A-B a -B testing and actually run experiments in your game, you can actually use Google Analytics to help segment your user base and actually deliver things like different strings. And that can actually be used to change gameplay behavior. And you can actually set up like a result. Like what, what, what do I actually want to see as the result? And then have it optimized for that result automatically and start delivering that content automatically. So it's really cool. Um, I'm super excited about it. It's worth, worth checking out. I had to put a plug in there just because A-B testing means a lot to me. And I, you know, I actually, you know, one of the things I, I've been telling our team is I want to be able to A-B test everything. You know, like, you know, everything within play, everything with, you know, because you just need to know. I want to know what works. And uh, before, I, we haven't, we haven't, we haven't uh, and talked yet, Andy, so I wanted, I wanted you to get, get a word in on this I'd really like, question. Uh, I'd like you to be on the panel. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're much better than we are. Um, one of the things that concerns me, so I wear, so we have two parts to our business. One is, is um, the mobile part which is really interesting, and I, and I don't think I've learned quite so much in the last three years as I've ever learned. The difficulty is knowing what you're learning to be useful in any space of time, what you're learning to be utter crap. And it's not always obvious. We spent um, a million and a half pounds of our own money back in about seven or eight years ago um, in the Java days, and we shut that business down about three weeks before <laughs> the App Store was launched. Um, that was a salutary lesson in doing things the old-fashioned way, which is, get, you know, put some money in, make great games, and it's all going to be easy. Um, the other part of our business, we work on PC, and we, we work principally uh, with Steam. And what we're seeing there is, is a very interesting uh, dynamic with early access. And that's really changed the game as well. And one of the things I think I'm going to hate about making games, I don't actually, I don't like the word hate, it's quite, it's quite strong. Mm -hmm. And I don't hate much about making games right now. One of the things that concerns me is we've moved from console PC uh, two years in the studio, hitting the crunch, getting pissed off with what you're doing, and seeing that it never turned out like you thought it was going to do. You know that thing? To the power of 200 people, which can be quite destructive. Into, we're on a service, we're on all the time, it's all fantastic. And you find that you're making the equivalent of Carly Minogue records. You know, whatever the public wants, you're going to give them. That, for me, as a creative, would be disturbing. And I'm mm -hmm. not sure I particularly like the prospect of that. But if it turns you on because you're going to make a ton of money, you can probably deal with that side of it and say, you know what, that's great, because it's really creative making all that money. But I just wonder how much uh, of the creative process 
we are then putting out to the crowd. And that might well be a good thing. I mean, you know, I, 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 well, don't, I don't believe in the alter. Do you not and that, le and that leads me to my next, actually, next, my next question, which was, what do you hate about free to play? Yeah, well, <laughs> that, that say, was... do you not think that's too extreme, though? Because actually, there's such a wide audience, you can make quite a core game and yeah. have a big audience. Yeah. So I don't think you know you're, you're throwing away any sort of moral fibre. No, no, I'm I'm, I'm trying to paint the sort of two extremes: the fascist yeah. and the communist. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> they, they go around the back through Alaska or somewhere. You know? Well, no, I was going to say when I was thinking about the question yeah. and you know how to answer it, because firstly, we all love making games. That's why mm. we're here. That's why we're doing this. Um, one of the I, one of those points I was going to make is monetization, mm. which is funny because that's principally what I'm responsible for at Miniclip. <laughs> so it's, it's the thing that I should love the most. And I do, but to Andy's point, yeah, you, you could talk about um, the ethics and the morals of free to play. And it is something that I think as an industry we're struggling with. Yeah. Because essentially there are a few ways that we have figured out in the market and as an industry that works. And a lot of us are all using those without any creativity or thought in the type of monetization loop. Mm -hmm. We've all got the game loops, I think, down. I think it's the monetization loops. The fact that we talk about monetization in the terms of friction and pain points is not a good, that's not good kind of verbiage to use anyway, but it kind of is indicative of the issues we have around monetization as an industry. Free to play, we're still figuring it out as an industry, yeah. I think. And I think until we've actually found a way where we're comfortable both ethically from a business perspective in mitigating the risk in trying to release some of these titles, I think we are going to struggle with this for a while. And I think, I mean, ultimately, it's free to play. Like, you know, Chris, Chris's team, and, you know, I, I came from the console space as well. We used to work together in, in, in days past. Um, it, you know, there was, there was something kind of honorable about spending $10 million and then trying to release a game and recouping that from, you know, th what the user has liked. But I mean, there was also something a little bit dishonorable because yeah. we would spend a lot on marketing and hyping the game, yeah. and then people would spend sixty dollars and then not enjoy the. Or, or, or they, or you know, or, big, big companies would hijack the space in Walmart, exactly. and, that, and that would be it so for the consumer. So it is, I think where we are now is is a million times better from where we've right. been. But, uh, but, but that's what I'm but saying. We're as we evolve, stuff out. Uh, yeah, yeah, as we evolve and as we figure out the correct models for our <laughs> consumer, because the other thing as well is, you know, this analytics focus is crucial. We none of us disagree with that. Mm -hmm. But to try and extract dollars from those users without presenting fair enough value, you know, it can't just be a compulsion loop. It's got to be a fun loop. Um, yeah, but there is another aspect to the analytics side. I totally agree on the monetization. I should like it also, but yeah, this yeah, yeah. is the dirty totally. part of work. But there is another aspect, even deeper than that, and that's the analytics. Our job is to analyze the behavior of the user. And if we do it well, we know how to tweak him towards the monetization. Now, the, the border of how much you track the user is becoming vaguer and vaguer. Yeah. We are getting companies that, starting by offering us to put their SDK and know every other app that the user has on his device. Other than that, when he's waking up and starting to activate the device, and what are we doing, actually? We are preparing the future into a world, I'm sorry for being apocalyptic, but <laughs> into a world that we track everything a person will do. And how do we do it? We use games. It's okay when NSA is doing it. They are spies, they are evil, oh. <laughs> they are oh, listening wow. to it. <laughs> Go ahead. NSA, NSA. Yeah. But, <laughs> But we're doing just, just kidding, you're right? not evil, really. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, it, but, but it is to, it is to Andy's point about creativity, right? If we are analyzing the user and just giving them what they want, which is, there is some benefit to that. And I would agree that we should be looking towards that in trying to cater towards our users. You know, innovation in our space is, is lacking. We are struggling to find um, games which effectively monetize in the free-to-play model. Um, and if we continue to use analytics to the extensive degree that we are, do, mm. we are currently using as an industry, we will not be looking, we won't be future looking. It will mm. always be looking behind us. Mm. And, you know, innovation and iterative design can work hand in hand. Mm. I just think some companies will have to start taking a, look, a little bit more risks. <laughs> I mean, Miniclip, we've got 900 plus web games that we can still bring over. Uh, so we've got a lot of innovation still to make. But for other companies, from the console space, I do appreciate that it's going to be a bit more difficult. But this is the beauty. It doesn't have to be a big mini clip company. It can no, it be doesn't. Flappy Bird coming out of nowhere, and, and, a developer. And that it proves that nothing, anything that I say today exactly. is meaningless. Yeah. Exactly. Don't <laughs> listen to anything I say. No, no, nobody knows anything. Yeah. 
<laughs> Ubisoft and this guy are basically the same. They have the same standing chance, and he won a company that's worth billions. So I think, no, as 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 we, uh, you know, that's just not going to be a sustainable model for yeah. our companies. We do have to try and mitigate risk, and we do have to try and make it a little bit more um, stable. Yeah. Because otherwise, we won't have companies who will create the next. Call of Duty on mobile, or the next FIFA on mobile. You know, for all the sins. Well, the next Call of Duty on mobile has been shut down. Oh yeah. You know, it shut down the Blast Furnace because they couldn't make any money out of it. Apparently. Well, not the next in the actual franchise, but but the next type. It says quite a lot. It does. It's the brutality of the world that we're in. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I I think the interesting thing is if you look at if you look at mobile gaming today, the the one thing still holds true, which is the games that are making the most money have the most engagement. Yeah. Which like which makes me think that at some level, they're the most engaging. Uh, and maybe that's not entirely true. Um, but it still means that we're still optimizing around making games engaging, rather than truly just optimizing around monetization. In I, fact, I, just, I just want to be very clear. I really, really like free to play. Let's not get that in, yeah. <laughs> any other way, OK? Mm-hmm. Um, I'm, I'm pretty clear about that. And, and most of the, if not all of the mobile games that we make will be free to play. Um, but well, I was with, with a really talented games um, developer, designer, last week. He's made the most awesome game I've seen on mobile. Um, and the subject matter particularly appeals to me. It's very, very humorous. But it is not a free-to-play game. It, mm-hmm. He hasn't designed it that way. He's built it, and he's, like, he's not interested in free-to-play because he doesn't understand it, and he, he's a games designer. That's a concern because it's like, well, where is that game going to go? If that doesn't get featured by the platforms heavily, um, it could just disappear nowhere. And that is one hell of a designer who's got a track record. Even actually, feature will not help a, now. Yeah, no, that's, no. That's a good point, because what you were talking about earlier, actually there's a lot of machinery that needs to be in place now to do all of this stuff. And with the best will in the world, even using these great tools, you need a lot of know-how and you need, you need a, f- a few pieces there to actually make free to play yeah. games work. Yeah. And um, that's almost getting back to that, that problem where you know, your flappy bird's right, OK, I take that as a kind of bolt of lightning, but... <clears throat> The smaller indies, it's, it's more and more hard, and it's more, more and more brutal in the market. You know, te- Tear Away, for example, if anyone's played that game, it's a lovely game. Um, does that exist in the world of mobile as a, as a paid for game? I mean, I, I, don't, I don't know, it's a question out there, really. But without Sony, mm-hmm. that game wouldn't have been made. Mm-hmm. No, sorry, go on. No, but to the point about the game developer you saw, I mean, Nothing's really, I mean, it's not really changed. I mean, no, it's, I same, it's yeah. the same with when we met a game designer yeah, yeah, you know, exactly. back in the publishing days. I mean, he might have created a great game, yeah. but if it didn't fit within the portfolio of the publishers, yes. it wouldn't have come out either. So at true. least this way, he's got a chance to sh- put yes. it on the market somewhere. Yeah, well, he will do. Yeah, yeah exactly. He'll publish it. Yeah. yeah. In paid? As yeah, paid? as paid, yeah. yeah. So, you Even know, though I say we don't do any paid very games. Very brave. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, sometimes you've got to be brave. So, I mean, I, and I guess one of the questions, that, that brings me to another question is, you know, in, in, in mobile right now, we really see a fairly strong divide. Um, we see games that are, that are ad-supported. We see games that, are, that are, are, are premium, where you buy the game and then you can buy in-app purchases. We see games that are supported by in-app purchases, and we see games that are actually premium. What business models are missing? You know, what, you know, what I mean, you know, is, is, there, is there something else that we should be thinking about? Yeah. <laughs> subscription. And, and subscription, of course, is actually... We, yeah, it's very convenient, but nobody will go for it. Why not? World of Warcraft did it for a while. <coughs> yeah, for a while. For a while. But the world is changing. The world is changing. I think if you skew younger, then subscription is much more meaningful as well. Yeah. I, I disagree. I think that, that, that people are not willing to obligate for long term. I agree, but and what I'm saying is that there is, potentially there is a space for somebody to fill that, possibly. So, so when you're talking, right about subscription, are you talking about a subscription game service where they where someone could you know select from a hundred different games and and it was aggregated down into public into developers and they ended up getting paid for their you know uh, the engagement that people are getting. But well, why you, there is free sus- subscription today? Google Play is free subscription <laughs> service. You go in, they feature, they choose a list of games that they think are good games, mm-hmm. it's free subscription. So why would anybody pay for any game service that would limit him to 100 games or 1,000 games? Uh, yeah, I, as I, said, I, I was talking more of the kind of MMO or young children's type One game, yeah. yeah. Yeah, well, you certainly, and young children, so, so one, of the, one of the questions I had is, um, 
what are the challenges when trying to make games for young children? I mean, I don't know how, I don't know how I don't know any of you've done, you know, with, with free to play and with this, with this new model. Because one, like, one of the traditional markets for games have been children. I certainly, that's sort of how I started playing games when I was very young. And um, so how do, we, how do we deal with that? And one of, the, one of the things that's been brought up is subscriptions around that. But talk about it. I mean, this is, it's one, it's one, I think it's one of the challenges. Yeah, payments is a diff payment is difficult. Um, Again, the ethics of free-to-play, how to present in-app purchases to that audience. Um, you've got to be very conscious of it. I mean, we've been copper compliant since we started, and mm -hmm. it's crucial for us to, to maintain that. Um, and also, you know, um, it's a hard audience to, to service now because yeah. there's so many apps out there for free. <clears throat> and that's why you can start talking about subscription and you yeah. go back to paid for, you know, especially, you know, if you go much younger than sort of 15 in reality. It's... it's uh, it's an open question, I think. It feels like there's a there's a paid paid app market for for yep. children's games. To I mean, talk about us make brilliant apps, and they, they charge for them at the moment. Um, I don't have any kids, but I, I'm sure there's plenty of parents. Who who are parents in the room? So at least half. Um, so I mean, what would you do? Would you give your child just free reign to just download what they want, or do, or do you want to pay? What would you do? Yeah, out of there, out of there, just as a show of hands. How many people would actually get a subscription for their kids if they knew that it was that it was content that was free and clear, and they just paid a monthly fee? Just out, just out of would actually do it. All right. Just, there you are. So you answered your own question. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I just confused. I'm learning. What do you think I can do? So, so I, we have we have, we have only a short period of time left. So I wanted to kind of give everyone a chance to to kind of make a closing statement around what we've talked about. I know we didn't get to everything. We I think we could have done a two-hour panel. Personally, I didn't want to bore everyone in the audience to death. Um, but I certainly enjoyed this. Um, so closing statement about about you know, um, what do you think is the best thing about what's ha about mobile? You know, what's well, you know, let's 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 close with the positive. Um, you know, what's, what's the best thing about, about, the f about mobile gaming and what it's done to the industry? Democratization and portability and one device in my, in my pocket. No? Yeah, I think it's a good thing to have broadened the you know, appeal and the availability of games to a, a broader audience. I also find it a lot easier to work pretty much anywhere because I'm doing mobile games, which is a curse as well. So I can pretty much be testing or playing with things <laughs> at any time of the day or night, which is... Um, different. <laughs> so true. I, I agree. One is the ability of every developer to compete with the EAs and the Ubisoft of a few years ago that nobody had the chance to, to dream about it. If you would dream about it, you would wake up and replace yourself. And <laughs> the second thing is the, um, the fact that in the Java days, we were looking at the target audience of 4% of the people that had mobile phones that are playing games. And we were struggling to get to five. <laughs> and now we're looking at audience of what? 90 whatever percent. Everybody are playing games. So we are living in a great time in a grant industry. So just good. Yeah, I 100% agree with that. I think the, uh, for me, it's the, the low barriers to entry, um, which means that you know, we'll talk about a panel here, we'll talk about children's games. And the panel will have seven or eight-year-olds making those games for those for their mates, and how they sell them, how they do it. That is going to happen within a matter of years. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the low barriers to entry do drive the innovation. And despite what I've said, I think that it's never been more original content being made across all devices. And the whole world now plays games, which they've always done because we always played games as kids, not video games, but other games. Mm -hmm. So it's a great time. And uh, it's interesting that um, that Google yourself refers to the great thing about mobile. Um, I think there's some pretty good stuff going on on PC as well, obviously. Um, and there's a number of PC developers in the room. And I don't think those two areas are exclusive. Not at all. And, and, and I actually, this is just me coming from my, my background as in mobile, not, not that. So that's, you're seeing my bias. No, I, I just, I mean, but from the perspective of, of the truly great companies outside of Google, mm -hmm. which is a great company, what Valve are doing is awesome, and what Oculus is doing is awesome. Absolutely. And this is the best time ever to be a games maker yeah. and probably a player. Um, so great, it's all bring it on. It's a great time to live. <laughs> I love this man. Yeah. I love this man. <laughs> well, I'd like I'd, I'd like to thank the whole panel for coming up here. You know, it's thank always you. it's always challenging to go in front of a room, especially a room this intimate like this, and and and, and just talk. So I, I really appreciate all, all of what you brought. And uh, so everyone, give them a round of applause. Thank you. And
And, uh, and we're going to move on to our, oh, we're next session. And um, I don't think, do we, do we actually have time for any questions? One quick question. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, well, we've got the panel up here. Only people that are paying for questions. <laughs> OK, it's a, a more of a suggestion. You said monetization model that doesn't exist. Uh, pay what you want. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I love that model. Yeah. Yeah. I have here. <laughs> <laughs> yes, exactly. Okay. Bumble, yeah. And actually, bundles. I, I'd like to see bundles. I'd like yeah. to see actually you know, people to be able to just, just to be able to host bundles on, on Play would be yeah, nice, yeah. Uh, you know, for, for personally. Another great company. <laughs> Anything else? Okay. All Thanks right. very much to Saad, Chris, Doran, and Andy. And thank you, Dan Galpin, for hosting. Nice to meet you. Thank you. Thanks, Dan. <laughs>